Our first reading this morning is Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty in his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown the people the power of his works and giving them the heritage of the nations. The work of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemptions to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. So I've received some positive feedback when I share a bit of context before I read some of our scripture passages today. So I hope you will indulge me. I'm going to do that this morning. This week's gospel lesson isn't quite as fraught as last week's talking about rich people and poor people. Uh, but this passage can fly right by because it's just nine verses, uh, but there's a lot packed in there that has to do with biblical history. So forgive me if this is repetitive because we have talked a little bit about Samaritans over the past couple months. Most people, Christian or not, are um, have probably heard of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And you may be like me that in your youth uh, and young adulthood, you didn't really think much about the fact that the person in that parable was a Samaritan. It was just one of those things. It was the Good Samaritan, and that was that. In fact, the word Samaritan, I think if you asked most people whether they go to church or not, if you asked them what it means, they would probably say it means good uh, because they know it simply from that parable. But if we were observant Jews living in Palestine in the first century, the very mention of Samaritans in a parable, let alone Jesus kind of lifting them up or talking with them in the parable, uh, would be uh, an affront to our sensibilities. Now, if you recall those stories from Genesis and Exodus, the children of Israel, the people who came to be known as the Jews, uh, were liberated from slavery in Egypt by God, and then God led them through the wilderness for a long time and then into the promised land of Canaan. They settled the land, and after generations of tribal rule, arguing with each other and very localized leadership, for 100 beautiful years, there was a united kingdom of Israel, not related to the current nation state, but the United Kingdom of Israel, then a split between Judah and Israel, north-south, and eventually they were conquered by the Assyrians, and many Jews were sent to exile in Babylon. Now, some Jews did not go to Babylon. They remained behind, and they intermarried with non-Jews in Samaria. So Samaritans, some of them even conspired with enemies when Jews started to return after the exile, and they started to return especially to Jerusalem. And returned exiles looked down on these folks who had stayed and intermarried, and they did not want the Samaritans' help when they decided we need to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed. So they saw Samaritans as impure, not Jewish. Samaritans built a different temple that was later vandalized by the Israelites. All of this was about 500 years before Christ. 
So these differences and tensions were both religious and political. They had to do with land and all of these complicated matters, and they lasted for centuries and centuries. Enmity between Jews and Samaritans was deep in Jesus' time. In modern times, it would be a little bit akin, although it lasted a lot longer, uh, be like the tensions between Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, especially during the Troubles in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. In Jesus' religious and political landscape, the Samaritans were completely other. They were unclean and pushed to the edges of society. So, remembering all this about how most Jews reviled Samaritans, let's listen to Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him, keeping their distance. They called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When Jesus saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not 10 made clean, but the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, I'm going to ask our ushers to help me out a little bit. Uh, those of you who are young or young at heart and would like a copy of this handout, Larry has one, um, especially um, you don't have to be under 18 to get one of these. I didn't make enough for everyone, but Larry, would you go ahead and give some to some people? Uh, this is, yeah, there we go. This is the lyrics of our final hymn tonight. Now thank we all our God. So you don't need this sheet of paper if you wanted to open your hymnal to 555. If you're at home, especially, you don't have this sheet because I didn't think of it uh, in time to send it out on Friday. Um, but we're going to just take a quick look at the first verse of Now Thank We All Are God, number 555 in the blue hymnal, if you wanted to look that up. So the first line is Now Thank We All Are God with hearts and hands and voices. So either during the service, if you like to doodle or if you like to take you know, notes and just go down a rabbit hole during my sermon, which is absolutely fine, go ahead if you would. Think of ways in which we uh, can thank God. Heart, hands, voices, it's all wonderful. But maybe there are other ways in which you think of that you particularly or others thank God. So that second line that I've bolded, who wondrous things has done. The psalm, as I'll talk about, uh, list some of those things, but if you want to go ahead and draw pictures or take notes of some of the wondrous things that God has done, either in the Bible, throughout history, or perhaps in your very own life, some of the wondrous things that God has done. And then that next line, um, in whom this world rejoices, it's a little bit like that first line about ways in which we can thank God. You can think on, and this is again something you could do this morning or through the week, um, where is there joy in the world as a result of God's loving actions? And then this next line is one of my favorites, who from our mother's arms hath blessed us on our way. This is where you might draw or list people who have blessed you, especially in your life of faith and inspired you and led you to a deeper practice. And then again, that, uh, exercising gratitude with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. You might want to list some gifts that God has given you 
it could be through these people, but something that God has done or given you that you feel blessed by that. So this is simply an invitation, especially as we sing the hymn at the end of the service or through today's service or later on today to use a hymn as a matter of devotion, just the way we use the Bible as a way of devotion. So let us pray. Loving God, thank you so much for songs that lift our hearts and express our joy and praise of you. As we seek wholehearted gratitude, may music and lyrics guide us ever closer to that. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, our hearts, be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So many years ago, an elderly English pastor was famous for his pulpit prayers, and he always found something to thank God for, even in bad times. So one stormy Sunday morning, you know how those happen, when everything was going extremely badly in the community and in the lives of many people in the congregation, himself included, he stepped to the pulpit to pray. And a member of the congregation thought to himself, the preacher will have nothing to thank God for on a wretched morning like this. The pastor began his prayer we thank thee, O oh God, that it is not always like this. So finding a way to be grateful is not always easy, and to pretend otherwise, I think, is uh, a bit naive. So this is especially true when we are going through a difficult time, or perhaps our world is in a great deal of turmoil, as it seems to be all the time or much of the time right now. Now, of course, a beautiful autumn morning, like this morning, the crisp air and the clear skies can make it that much easier for us to feel gratitude uh, to God. And as usual, our scriptures, our Bible passages, can both inspire and challenge us to find this gratitude. Psalm 111, verse 1, in most translations, the one that Larry read, uh, reads, Praise the Lord, I will give thanks to God with my whole heart. Eugene Peterson, uh, you may be familiar, I've quoted it before, his down-to-earth paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. His uh, Psalm 111, verse 1, reads, Hallelujah, I give thanks to God with everything I've got. The psalm goes on to list God's saving deeds through the history of Israel, as I mentioned, and verses 7 through 10 are really about God's giving the law and the covenant to the people. So the message ends Psalm 111 this way, the Lord's hallelujah lasts forever. Psalm 111 is one of those psalms that begins verses or phrases within verses alphabetically. It's an acrostic, if you've heard that word before. It's the Hebrew A to Z, verse 1, begins with their equivalent of what we would call an A, and the final, uh, it goes all the way through the alphabet. And it emphasizes, just in the very way the psalm was written and sung or spoken at the time, emphasizes the wholeness of God, the A to Z, the Alpha and Omega uh, of God's steadfast love for humanity. So to be wholehearted is to put one's whole self into something, to give it, as Eugene Peterson says, everything you've got. And all in gratitude is what this psalm is all about. And it pairs very well with the story of the one leper who returns. Wouldn't we all like to have a whole heart whose thankfulness eclipses the sometimes negative ways we can get distracted or be brought down? 
So let's turn now to that story of the 10 lepers and the one who came back. Luke's gospel, of course, has many stories about healing, and uh, today's is one of those. And it is, seems to be much more about a response to healing than it focuses so much on the healing itself. In fact, uh, I'll talk a minute about how that happens. Verse 11 tells readers immediately where Jesus is, that Jesus and the disciples are on the way to Jerusalem, which readers often know that means he's on the way to the cross, to his passion and death on the cross. Now they are in the region between their home in Galilee and this land of the foreigners, Samaria. Note how the gospel makes it clear that the lepers were separated from other people of the village. It's as Jesus and the disciples are entering the village that they see the lepers uh, and they approach, they, they don't approach Jesus, they keep their distance and they still, they know that that's the convention, to, but so they have to cry out from afar. And that's why I tried to raise my voice a little bit. Jesus have mercy upon us. Now, of course, perhaps they wanted a donation of money, but instead Jesus looks at them from afar and tells them to go and show themselves to the priest. So in Jewish practice, lepers were considered unclean, so they could not worship with fellow Jews and they could not come inside the village or city. If they were healed, there were laws about having the priest look at them and attest to their becoming clean. So at that time, they could perform rituals and re-enter society and religious practice. This is about so much more than healing a physical ailment. ailment. So even if the 10 lepers had wanted money, which seems unlikely, they must have believed in Jesus' power to heal because they obediently, as soon as he says, go show yourselves to the priest, they obediently begin walking to the priest, we assume, at the synagogue. The healing happens off stage, so to speak. It simply says, and as they went, they were made clean. Luke tells us that just one of them, once he realized that he had been healed, turned back praising God with a loud voice, throwing himself at Jesus' feet, the healed man thanks Jesus. And that is when Luke drops this bombshell, at least it's a bombshell for those first century Jewish followers of Jesus. This one man praising God, recognizing Jesus as a godly man, and thanking him. This person is not a fellow Jew, but a Samaritan of all people. If we were hearing this as first century Jews, we would probably feel the pinch. Ouch. The nine healed lepers who did not return were not bad people. At least I don't think they were. After all, they were simply doing what Jesus told them to do, which is go show themselves to the priests. And the Samaritan had no hope of being restored to, of course, Jewish synagogue and communal life by going to the priest. But the other nine did, so they kept walking to show themselves to the priest and begin their new lives. Their physical healing was real, but we don't really know how they might have been changed in other ways. By returning, praising God, and thanking Jesus, the Samaritan found an additional kind of wholeness. Now, while the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible has Jesus saying, your faith has made you well, other translations have language that I honestly prefer. Uh, have, your faith has saved you. The healed Samaritan leper is now in a new relationship with God. He knows a wholeness that goes far deeper than smooth skin. So even though the day of Thanksgiving is over a month away, this whole season of autumn and harvest and apples and uh, changing leaves and um, 
is a wonderful time to reflect on gratitude as part of our journey of faith. I think it was about five or six years ago, I found an application, an app for my smartphone, and I used it. Um, this one encouraged writing down several, oh, writing down, typing in to the phone uh, each day, something or several things for which I was grateful. I used it actually daily. I was very uh, devout in a way I'm often, it's hard for me to do things daily. I like change. But I did use it every day for a year, and it really did make a positive difference in my life. And I feel the need to start something like that again. It's not just Oprah Winfrey that knows that fostering gratitude is healing. Many people know that if we look for something for which to be thankful, we are more likely to see good in our lives. So there's a flip side to that too. I read about someone who tried to give up complaining for a month. Can you imagine that? Some of you are all constantly cheerful and never complain, but I think that's a big challenge. So everyone, of course, needs to vent now and then, but this woman was letting go of negativity that often emerges when we complain. Some studies have shown that using curse words instead of alleviating stress actually increases the stress in our lives, which some people argue to the contrary, but I think it's true. In the same way, complaining feeds the monster of negativity that we would be better off putting on a strict diet. In this case, the person trying to give up uh, complaining kept a journal of failures. In other words, com uh, those times when the complaints worked their way into her day despite her effort to avoid them. Even with the inevitable slip-ups, she says, uh, she said that she really did feel less stressed and had a more positive outlook on her life. So this kind of swimming against the cultural current can be very difficult if we attempt it on our own. So together, this morning, through the coming weeks, we can reflect on some ways that we can support each other in congregational, wholehearted gratitude. One of a thousand reasons why Christian community is so important is so that we can help each other to form habits, in this case, habits of wholeness, and in some ways hold each other accountable, but there's no finger pointing here which is easy to collapse into that, but we just agree with each other that we would like to complain less and be more wholeheartedly thankful. Maybe you can share with others ways in which you've found, uh, things that have helped you in that effort to become more wholeheartedly grateful. And if we encourage each other, perhaps we can get a little closer to that kind of wholehearted gratitude exhibited by that one in ten, the foreigner, the Samaritan whose faith saved him. So I'd like to end with a little story shared by a retired United Methodist pastor named John Ed Matheson. It seemed to speak to this search for wholehearted gratitude, and he wrote, I heard once about a church from North Carolina that sent a mission team to a leper colony on the Caribbean island of Tobago. The team met a lot of patients who were afflicted with leprosy. One memorable experience was a worship service that they held in the campus chapel. The lepers came in and took their seats on the pews and the mission team led them in singing some hymns. The pastor of the group was named Jack, and he noticed that there was one leper who sat in the back row who was facing the opposite direction. All the rest of the lepers were facing the song leader. So Jack announced, we have time for one more hymn. Does anyone have a favorite? About this time, the leprous woman on the back row turned around and for the first time faced the song leader. Jack said it was the most hideous sight he had ever seen in a human being. She had no nose or lips. Her head was almost like a skull. 
When she raised her arm in the air, she had no hand. It was just a nub. The pastor then said, this leprous person said, could we sing count your many blessings? It was at that point that the whole mission team experienced something that they had never experienced before. Here was a person with relatively nothing to be thankful for, asking to sing, count your many blessings. At first, they couldn't even lead the song. And then they sang it with new meaning. When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. If a leprous person on the island of Tobago had as her favorite hymn, count your many blessings, how much more should we not just sing the song, but do what it says? Thanks be to God. Amen.